Chapter 4 Thorvi and her family usually made a trip to the town of Ripa every summer. Her brother Ivar lived there with his wife, Bera, and Thorvi had grown up nearby. Ivar and Bera and their children always loved to see Gunnhild and Rolf, and Gunnhild couldn't wait to hear about the adventures her cousins had had over the past year. The town sat on the coast at the mouth of the Ripa River. It was a safe port for boats trading up and down the coast, and people came from inland farms to buy and sell. Some people had set themselves up as merchants, buying imported glass, silk, or wine and selling it on at a profit. The town was full of craftsmen, too, and blacksmiths, potters, tanners, and shipbuilders made it their home. Overseeing it all was Jarl Thorstein, who kept the peace and judged disputes, and of course charged a fee to every boat that docked. Ripa was small compared to great cities like Paris or Aachen. It had not quite three hundred people in it, but it was one of the biggest ports in Denmark. For the family, the trip to Ripa was one of the high points of the year. Inga usually stayed behind to tend the animals, but she offered to go this time instead of Thorvi, whose pregnancy was beginning to show. They usually made the trip on foot, and it took two days walking with one night spent beneath the stars. Thorvi, however, said they would ride with Freudus, who needed to go to Ripa anyway in her cart. It would take the same amount of time, the horse being old and slow, but she could stay off her feet and bring the woolen cloth that she and Inga had spent all year weaving. Before they set off, the family said a prayer to Thor. Inga got the family statue of Thor out of its special box and set it on the hearth. A rich family might have sacrificed an animal for this prayer, but Gunnhild's family couldn't afford a sacrifice for a simple ritual like this. Instead of blood, they used mead, which Inga, the head of the family with kettle away, held in a bowl, and with her fingers flicked mead at the statue of Thor while reciting the prayer. She passed the bowl around, and each person did the same. Then Thorvi and her children hugged Inga and set off in Freudus's cart. Thor must have heard, because the journey went smoothly, and they arrived at Ivar and Bera's house late the next afternoon. When their cousins heard them approaching, they ran outside to greet them. The house was very near the river, upstream from the town itself. Ivar's sailboat was tied up at the side of the river, but it was a quick journey downstream to the marshy Wadden Sea, where Ivar and his sons fished. Ivar and Bera had five children, four of whom still lived at home. Ofig was a grown man, recently married, and his wife lived with the family now, too. Bragi was two years older than Gunnhild, and the girls, Dagnu and Signu, were younger. An older sister, Unna, was married and living on a farm with children of her own. With the new arrivals, there were ten people in one house, and the children spent most of the time outside to avoid being crowded together. For sleeping arrangements, Gunnhild and Rolf doubled up with cousins, and Ofig slept on the floor so that Thorvi could share with his wife Svala. It was a tight squeeze, but they managed. Gunnhild and Rolf's days were packed with playing games and going exploring. Gunnhild showed Dagnu and Signu how to spin yarn. Rolf idolized Bragi and followed him everywhere. Bragi good-naturedly let Rolf wrestle with him and play with swords and agreed to be the bear king who got defeated by Rolf's brave pack of wolf warriors again and again and again. It was a glorious week, but for Gunnhild, going sailing was the best part. Most mornings, Ivar, Ofig, and Bragi took the boat out fishing, but Rolf monopolized most of Bragi's time, and Ivar didn't mind letting him off if it meant that he got to take his niece sailing. There are worse things than being a fisherman, said Ivar. The sea will always have fish, and if you have a boat, you'll never go hungry. Some day I'll have enough saved to buy another boat, and then Ofig can go on his own and we'll get double the catch. If you ever get bored of watching barley grow, said Ofig, come out to the sea. Find a fisherman for a husband and help him haul in the net. Why doesn't Svala fish with you? she asked her cousin. Uncle Ivar snorted. Her dainty hands are far too delicate, right, Ofig? My hands are dainty, said Gunnhild, holding one up to look at. You're my sister's daughter, smiled Ivar. Did I tell you about the time Thorvi pulled out an infected tooth of mine with her bare hands? I once pulled a calf out of a cow with my bare hands, said Gunnhild brightly. Exactly, said Ivar. You have the makings of a fisherman. Now help me set the mast and we'll get going. The boat was of a type called a fairing, a beautiful sleek craft fifteen feet long and pointed at both ends. A mast that could be raised or lowered held a square sail, and there were two pairs of oars. 
Ivar sat down in the back by the tiller, the wooden arm that moved the rudder and steered the boat. When Gunhild went to sit in front facing forward, he said, Oh no, you get to face the other direction. Your seat is right here in front of Ofig. I get to row? she said excitedly. First thing a fisherman has to learn, said her uncle, but it was much harder than Gunhild had thought it would be. They launched the boat down the river, and Ofig expertly dipped his oars into the water and pulled back on them, sending the boat smoothly across the water. Gunhild tried to do the same, but she couldn't get both oars to work together. Instead of dipping smoothly, her oars skittered across the surface. Everything felt backward, and soon her shoulders and hands ached. What about the sail? asked Gunhild. Not time yet, said her uncle. Wait until we get out in the open. Even then, it only works when the wind is with you. Many times we find ourselves rowing against the wind, right, Ofig? Many times, agreed his son. As they followed the river, the town of Ripa appeared, and Gunhild watched the houses and tents pass by and recede into the distance as she rowed. There were other boats on the river now. Some were docked at a wooden pier, and others were sailing. One boat, twice as large as their own, was pulling up, and Gunhild stopped rowing to gawk at the men at the oars. The ship was so big that each man had only one oar, and they sat in a row of four down each side of the boat. Their wrists were attached to the oars by leather thongs. The straps. Is that so they don't lose the oars? asked Gunnhild. Where? asked Ivar. Those men had leather ties on their wrists, on the big boat. Those are slaves, child. They're tied so they don't escape, or attack their master when they're out at sea. Gunnhild watched the other boats come along the pier. Two men, they must have been the masters, gave directions to the rowers, and one threw a rope to someone on the pier. She had heard about slaves. She knew that Jarl Thorstein had a dozen of them that worked his fields, as did some of the other landowners around the area. How did they become slaves? she asked. Captured in battle, said Ivar. Those ones look Baltic, but who knows. Will they always be slaves? Those ones? Probably, said her uncle. I've heard of masters letting slaves earn money to buy their freedom, or setting them free after their master dies. I heard of a farmer down the coast a ways that fell in love with his slave and married her. But the ones on the boat? They'll probably row till they die. Oh, look out, here's the mouth of the river. Gunhild hadn't noticed because she was facing backward, but they were fast approaching the place where the river opened up into a sandy, marshy expanse of water. This was the Wadden Sea, a wide, calm area between the shore and the coastal islands that kept the vast North Sea at bay. Is this the ocean? Not for about three more miles, said Ivar, but this is where we fish. Could you fish out on the ocean? Sure, said Ofig, but just wait until those waves get going. You'll turn green and ask to go home again. I'm tougher than that, insisted Gunhild. I bet I wouldn't get seasick. Let's raise the sail. Give your arms a rest, said Ivar. They pulled the oars in, and Ofig hauled on a rope that raised the yard, the long pole that held the top of the sail, until it reached the top of the mast. The wind caught the sail immediately, and Gunhild felt the boat come to life. Suddenly she was flying. She turned around to face forward. The boat, once a heavy clunky thing to her, now skipped over the water, and salty spray dampened her face. This is fantastic, she said, and her uncle smiled and nodded. The Wadden Sea was dotted with sandbanks and tall grass. Wading birds searched for food in the shallows, and ducks dabbled among the weeds. On the sandy shoreline, Gunhild saw seals sunning themselves, and a pelican circled overhead and occasionally dived to catch a fish. It's nice and calm here, said Ivar, but you have to look out for sandbars. The tide comes in and out, and you can get stuck if you're not careful. They sailed for about ten minutes before Ivar judged it was time to let out the net. They used a drift net to fish. The net was fifty feet long, a long tube made from knotted hemp string with a float at the end. Ofig showed Gunhild how to let it out slowly to keep it from getting tangled. When the net was completely in the water, Ofig and Gunhild took a break and ate some of the bread and cheese that they had brought, while Ivar sailed around, dragging the net behind. May I steer it? asked Gunhild. Ivar moved to the side and let her sit in the back and showed her how to use the tiller. It was strange at first because she had to move the tiller in the opposite direction to where she wanted the boat to go. What if I want to turn around and sail the other way? she asked. Well, then you lower the sail and row, my girl. 
said Ivar. You can't sail against the wind, but you can sail sideways to it. See, the wind pushes on the sail, but the rudder keeps the boat facing to the right, so that it goes that way. Whoa, whoa, too far. Ease off. Good. Ivar scooted away from Gunhild so that she had more room. Perfect, he said, leaning back and propping up his feet. If I fall asleep, wake me when it's time to haul in the net. With that, he closed his eyes and dozed off. Hauling in the drift net was a new and fascinating experience for Gunhild, too. The net caught anything that swam into it. Salmon, cod, herring, flounder, even rays. She pulled the net out of the water bit by bit, and Ivar guided it up over the side of the boat and reached in to grab each fish, hit its head against the side of the boat, and handed it to Ofig. Ofig was waiting with a thin, sharp knife, and he took each fish and with a few quick strokes gutted it, and, reaching inside its belly, pulled out the insides and threw them overboard. He threw the fish in the bottom of the boat and reached for another as his father handed it to him. He was so quick and precise that he could finish a fish in seconds, his knife slipping in and out of its gills and belly effortlessly. I'll teach you to do this part back on land, said Ofig. It takes some practice. Hm. I'll skip the fish guts, thank you, said Gunhild. She suddenly felt a slimy blob hit her face as Ofig flung a handful of entrails at her. She gasped and inhaled a sickening stench, and her uncle burst out laughing. You don't get to skip the fish guts, cousin, laughed Ofig. The fish guts always find you. Gunhild glared at her cousin and flung the entrails back at him, but he ducked and they went overboard. After the net was in, and all the fish were on the floor of the boat, they packed them into net bags. Then Ivar took the tiller again and steered as close to the mouth of the river as the wind would allow, where they lowered the sail and put in the oars again. Here, said Ivar, I'll row this time. You steer. Gunhild was very grateful, but didn't want to let on how exhausted she was, so she simply nodded and sat at the back by the tiller, and they made their way home up the river. When they arrived back at the house, they handed over the fish to Bera and Svala, who took them to the drying racks to salt them and hang them up along the side of the house. Rolf ran up to Gunhild and looked her over. You smell like fish, he said, wrinkling his nose. You smell like Rolf, she said, and went inside to wash up and help cook dinner. Gunhild went out fishing on the Wadden Sea twice more. Ivar was happy to have a new student who was as anxious to learn as his two boys had been, and he taught Gunhild all he could, how to pull one corner of the sail close to the mast when sailing sideways to the wind, how to steer with one hand while changing the tension of the sail with the other. Gunhild lapped it up. Soon it would be time for her family to return home, much to Gunhild's disappointment. They needed to ride home with Freudus, though, and were dependent on her plans. Two days before it was time to go, the whole family went to the village of Ripa. Ivar, Ofig, and Bragi carried the stacks of folded woolen cloth that Thorvi had brought to trade, and on the way they argued over whether she should sell it for silver or trade it directly, and which of the merchants would give her a better price. Thorvi needed linen to make clothes and sheepskin for the beds, as well as new shoes for Rolf and new bowls, plates, and spoons. Bera also wanted a cut of beef for a big family meal before it was time for her sister to go home, and she and Thorvi discussed what to buy and how best to cook it. As the group approached the town, Gunhild could see the houses and tents come into view. They passed a large cattle pen with at least thirty steers destined either to pull a plow or be served for dinner. Further along, a group of men were shaping logs into planks using axes. Wood chips covered the ground and a stack of fresh logs waited behind them. Each man chopped carefully at the wood to make it straight and smooth. One had a broad axe, which had a huge blade for making an even surface, and when Rolf saw it he shouted in excitement and pointed out to everyone that it was indeed a very big axe. People greeted them as they passed. Ivar and Bera knew many of them, and some even knew Thorvi from when she was younger. Almost everyone commented on her pregnancy and wished her well. There was one main road through the town, and the merchant's stalls lined it on both sides. Behind them were homes and storehouses, most of them smaller than the farmhouses meant for an extended family. Rising behind them on one side, however, was Jarl Thorstein's Hall, as big as a large longhouse, but beautifully made, with a carved door frame and a shield hanging above the door. On the other side of town, behind the houses, was the temple, where the statues of Odin, Thor, and Frey were kept. 
When they reached the pier at the center of town, Ivar and Ofig went with Thorvi to negotiate for the price of the cloth, and the children were left to amuse themselves, which was easy enough to do. They watched boats being loaded and unloaded. One crew had to get six pigs from a nearby pin onto their boat, and the pigs didn't want to go. The onlookers laughed at the scene, especially when one sailor lost his footing and was dragged through the mud as he held onto the pig's rope. Another boat's crew walked by, speaking in an accent clearly not Danish. Why do they talk so funny? asked Rolf, and Bragi guessed that they were from Norway. Nearby, some men were taking turns wrestling, and Rolf and Bragi were hooked. The men began by grabbing each other's belts, and the object was for one to throw the other off his feet. The men fought hard and fell hard, but they helped each other up afterward and laughed about it. One noticed Rolf and Bragi watching and invited them to try it. The man threw Bragi three times with little effort, but when it was Rolf's turn, he pretended to find it difficult and with great exaggeration let Rolf throw him down and congratulated him on his strength. While this was happening, Gunhild stole away and went to look at the tents that lined the main street. Merchants stood behind cuts of meat hanging from hooks or tables with bowls of salt and bags of dried peas. She found a woman selling jewelry made of silver, bronze, amber, and glass. She passed a woman weaving baskets and a man making a pair of leather shoes. She passed two men with spears and helmets and long knives at their belts. They wore fine cloaks and high leather boots. She wondered if they were the Jarl's men, or warriors returning home, or raiders readying for a voyage. She had never actually seen a real helmet before, but found it chilling, almost fearsome, the way it obscured their faces with grim, forbidding steel. She walked past Jarl Thorstein's hall, where two men with spears stood by the door. She marveled at the size of the hall and the workmanship of the carved door and posts. She knew the Jarl was away with her father and uncle, raiding, but his household was still busy. She had heard he had a wife and children, and household servants as well as men-at-arms. Gunhild wondered if she, announcing herself as the daughter of one of the Jarl's crew, would be permitted inside the hall, but she didn't feel brave enough. She was, after all, only a farmer's daughter. The Jarl's family was of a different social class, and Gunhild sensed that someone like her shouldn't ask to come in for no better reason than to look around. Instead, she approached the guards. "'Good day,' she said. "'Good day,' one responded, but he seemed bored. "'Do you know when Jarl Thorstein will return?' she asked. "'The Jarl intends to return before the assembly later this summer,' was the response. She had more questions she wished she could ask. "'Does the Jarl give feasts in his hall? Is it filled with gold and silver? Who judges law cases while the Jarl is away? Whom do his children play with?' The questions seemed impertinent, however, and the guards didn't invite conversation, so Gunhild walked on. Soon she passed by the blacksmith, whose constant hammering could be heard throughout the village. A boy about her age, maybe an apprentice, was carrying a bucket of water to the forge. "'Does he make swords?' she asked him, nodding at the blacksmith. "'He does,' said the boy, who set down the bucket to talk. "'How much does a sword cost?' asked Gunhild. "'Maybe a hundred pieces of silver, depending,' said the boy. "'Do you need a sword?' "'Not for me,' said Gunhild. "'How much do you think a milk cow would sell for?' "'A cow?' said the boy, clearly confused. "'Maybe forty pieces of silver? Why?' Gunhild frowned, wondering whether her father would have been able to buy what he had needed for his voyage, but having fun at the boy's confusion. "'No reason,' she said, and thanking him, she kept walking." As she walked, she let her mind drift to Osbjorn. She had not seen him in a while, but compared to the blacksmith's apprentice, she couldn't help but find Osbjorn favorable. He was a head taller, at least, with strong shoulders, and she found herself now thinking of his smile and his eyes. As the pounding from the forge faded, another sound caught her attention. Music. The sound of plucked strings was unlike any she had heard before, and it captivated her. She picked up her pace, looking for where it was coming from, and soon she found it. A man sat cross-legged on a rolled-up blanket with a bag at his side. On his lap he had a lyre, a long wooden frame with six strings stretching top to bottom. He held it upright with one hand and played with the other, and the melody seemed to wrap around Gunhild and pull her closer. She had never imagined that there was music like this in the world. She stood and listened for a while, then sat and continued to listen. Eventually the man stopped and spoke to her. 
Do you like it? he asked. It's wonderful. What is it? said Gunhild. It's a harpa, he said. I am Ovar. I come from the south, from the hall of King Siegfried at Hithabu. I'm Gunhild Kettle's daughter, she replied, feeling foolish. I'm sorry to bother you. You're not bothering me, child, he said. Remember that Gunnar played his harpa in a pit full of vipers. He had to play with his toes because his hands were tied. Now, that was bothersome, but you are not. He smiled. I'm bound for Birka, but the boat doesn't leave until tomorrow. Why was he in a pit of vipers? Atli, the king of the Huns, threw him in when Gunnar wouldn't tell him where his gold was hidden. Here, sit down. Ovar began to play, and Gunnhild listened enraptured. Cunning Atli, king and warrior, sent a message saying, Gunnar, brother of my beauty, Guthrun, high unto my hall. Clever Guthrun, Gunnar's sister, wife unto the wicked Atli, knew the message much deception, treacherous the trap. Ovar continued to play until Bragi found her and told her it was time to go. She got up to leave, but quickly remembered her manners. Safe travels to Birka, she told the musician. Be well, child, he said, and smiling, continued to play. As the family walked back home, Gunhild seemed in a daze, her mind elsewhere. What's gotten into her? asked Beira. She's off with the elves. Gunhild heard, but ignored it. She was playing the lyre's melodies over and over in her head. Dinner was a feast of beef roasted over an outdoor fire, alongside bread, mushy peas, and berry jelly. The family set up a table outdoors, too, but there wasn't enough room for everyone, so Rolf, Dagnu, and Signu sat with each other on a blanket on the ground, but Gunhild sat at the table with the adults. "'What did you get up to in town?' asked her mother. "'Oh, it was... Uh, I met this...' Gunhild stumbled over her words. Do you think that I could have a harpa to play? Um, her mother began. I suppose there's no reason you couldn't. Someday? Gunnhild was caught off guard by her mother's hesitancy and wondered if there was something wrong with playing the lyre or the man she had met. Well, you'll never guess what your mother found for you, Bera said. Should I get them, Thorvi? Thank you, Bera, said Thorvi, and Bera brought her some things from inside the house. Rolf, come here, said Thorvi. She produced a small wooden shield from under some fabric and held it out to him. For me, he said. He took the shield in his hand and whooped with delight. He ran off in search of his wooden sword, and Thorvi turned to her daughter next. She held up a green woolen dress with beautiful white and blue trim. Pinned at the front were two bronze brooches decorated with knotted shapes and animals. It was clearly a dress for a young woman, not a child. It's amazing, said Gunnhild. She took it to admire and kept from looking her mother in the eyes as she thought of what had just happened. Her mother had sold a year's worth of fabric to buy things for the household, and out of this had spared enough for presents for her and Rolf. She had bought this beautiful dress, maybe with the last piece of silver she had, and yet the first thing Gunnhild had asked at dinner was whether she could have a liar. Gunnhild felt ashamed and ungrateful, though it wasn't her fault or anyone else's. She made sure to thank her mother again and to praise the craftsmanship and the colors of the dress. Ivar passed around more bread, and the conversation at the table started back up again. Bragi, who was never very tactful, said to Gunnhild, You like that harpa so much, you should be careful never to meet a nook. What's a nook? asked Gunnhild, annoyed that he had brought it up, but curious about anything to do with the instrument she had heard. Mm, a water spirit smiled Ivar, very dangerous to young ladies. They wait at lakes and rivers and play music and lure girls into the pond with them, said Bragi, happy to know something his cousin didn't. They take the form of handsome men, almost as handsome as me. That got a gale of laughter from the table. Gunnhild, did you hear the story of why water lilies are red? asked Ivar. There was once a fisherman in his family who lived near a large lake, 
Every year the fishing got worse and worse, and it was difficult to feed his family. He tried everything to increase his catch, but it was no use. One day he met a nook by the river who said he could help him catch all the fish he could ever want. Did he trick the fisherman? asked Signu, who was listening nearby. No, he asked for the fisherman's daughter in return. The fisherman agreed, and from that day on he caught more fish than he could believe. His family was never hungry again, but he knew that when his daughter was grown, he would need to give her to the nook. And finally that day came. "'Would you give me away for fish?' asked Signu. Ivar reached out and pulled her close and said, "'Of course not.' He turned back to the table. "'She did not want to go,' he continued, "'but her father made her. However, when the nook came to claim her at the edge of his lake, she pulled from her bag a knife and plunged it into her heart, killing herself. Her blood flowed into the lake, and all the water lilies turned red. Why did she kill herself? said Signu, looking horrified. Because, said Ivar, there's nothing worse for a brave, free person than to be a slave. The fisherman's daughter chose to die instead. The next day, Gunhild asked again to go out fishing and helped get the boat ready. She was learning where things went and how to take care of the equipment, and she was getting better at rowing, too. It helped that Ivar or Ofig was always on the other set of oars, but she had learned how to get into a rhythm and how to pull smoothly through the stroke and how to match the other rowers so that their oars didn't clash. As she rowed that morning, she asked her uncle, Do you think we could go out to sea today? I mean, the real sea. What's out there that you want to see? asked Ivar. The fishing is just as good this side of the islands. She wants to see the world serpent that encircles the ocean, kidded Ofig, or sail to Halogaland to see the northern lights. The truth was that Gunhild was getting to like sailing, and she hadn't stopped thinking of Osbjorn. He wanted to go sailing and trading on the open ocean instead of settling down on a farm, and of course if he left she couldn't go with him, unless... It seemed impossible, but what if she could join him? No one had ever given a reason that she couldn't, and she found herself occasionally daydreaming about standing next to Osbjorn, captain of a forty-foot ship with two dozen oars and a mast as tall as a tree, as they sailed for distant lands. Why not, said Ivar. No Dane can resist the sea. It's in our blood. But the sea can be cruel. You can love it, but never trust it. What do you mean? asked Gunhild. It gives things and it takes things, said Ivar. It took my brother. I didn't know you had a brother, said Gunhild. Arnulf, said Ivar. Ofig, you were what, three? More than that, said Ofig. I remember it. I remember when you came home without him. There was a bad storm, said Ivar. We were fishing when we saw the clouds rolling in. We turned and headed back, but it was fast. The waves were coming at us from behind as we ran with the wind, and we were doing pretty well. Then suddenly... So... We weren't even going to try to get back to the river. We just wanted to get to land. Gunhild nodded her head. This wasn't a normal wave, said Ivar. It was approaching from behind, and it was maybe ten feet high. I've never seen one that big. Arnolf was at the tiller and didn't see it coming. I shouted and pointed, and he turned just as it crashed over us. I held on, and it hit me like a wall. When I opened my eyes, Arnolf was gone. Ivar paused. I shouted for him and looked all around in the water, but he never came up. They sat for a moment in silence. So, yes, let's take this boat out past the islands, her uncle continued. But some day, my future fisher lady, you'll see dark clouds on the horizon. Just never underestimate the sea, or Thor in his fury. They sailed out of the river and past the wide marshes, past the reeds and wading birds, and approached the islands. As they approached the open water, Gunhild could see that it looked different, moved differently. The sea was calm that day, and the waves that rocked the boat were small, but as soon as she felt them, Gunhild knew that everything had changed, that in crossing over to the North Sea they were turning away from home and looking out into the wide world. They passed the islands and glided into the vast expanse of silver, and before her Gunhild saw only the endless horizon. Ivar directed her out a distance and they pulled out the net. He told her about currents, and where they flowed and how to use them. 
He told her about using different weights or floats on the net in order to catch different fish, and how to ride out a storm by using the net as a sea hanger. They spent hours towing the net back and forth, practicing turning, adjusting the sail, gauging the wind and reading the clouds. They got home late that evening, and Gunhild was exhausted and sore, her skin chapped by the salt spray and her hands raw from the ropes and nets. But when she got into bed that night, she couldn't sleep. When she closed her eyes, all she saw was the ocean, and all she felt was the wind and the tiller in her hand and the slow roll of the waves. <laughs>